HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. This year, Wisconsin Cheese is hosting the very first Art of Cheese Festival to celebrate all things curds. Head to www.artofcheesefestival.com for your tickets to Pastured Paradise. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Shelley Lindgren. We'll talk to Shelley about her new book, Italian Wine, and a lot more. We'll taste one of Shelley's tansy wines for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Bay Area native Shelley Lindgren never strayed far from home. She attended cooking school and cut her teeth in hospitality in San Francisco, furthering her passion for wine. Since 2004, she is the co-owner and wine director of San Francisco legend A16. Shelly is a leading voice on Italian wine and is responsible for exposing her customers and the rest of us to new wines from the other regions, grapes, and winemakers of Italy. She has won the James Beard Award for her outstanding wine program at 816. She's written two cookbooks, makes wine at Tansy, and most importantly, is a very active mom. Uh, Her new book, Italian Wine, the History, Regions, and Grapes of an Iconic Wine Region, is now available everywhere. And because of Shelley, you will eventually hear of or taste Fiano, Falangina, Aglianico, Tarassi, Coda di Volpe, Gragnano, and more. Shelley Lindgren, welcome to the Grape Nation. Hi, Sam. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, by the way. Well, we have yeah. a lot to talk about. Um, we're talking to Shelley live at the Heritage Radio Network Studios at Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, I had reached out to Shelley when her book came out. And I wanted to have her on to talk about the book. And I've been meaning to get her on the show. And I said, we could do it remotely. I could meet you at a hotel or we could do it at our studios at Roberta's. So Shelly being the hardcore pizza person, inquisitive person said, no, 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 we're, we're doing the show at pizza and we're eating at Roberta's and we're eating after. So I was happy that, you know, we could sit across from each other. All right. So I kind of know the answer because I follow you on Instagram, but generally what brings you to New York? So the book came out about three weeks ago now in, um, and um, earlier this year, I just um, have been planning, building, we've been strengthening our teams at A16 and uh, the release date, um, we knew it a long time ago. So it was always 
coming here, we did the James Beard event on Sunday. So that was I saw that. sort of the lead, the you leading and your event. Chef. Yeah, Chef Yosuke Machida is here with me. He's actually at Degustibus now. We're doing mm. a another regional food and wine pairing That's there. That's the Macy's. It's Macy's. Basement cooking. Oh, it's, it's the same Flores Santa land right, right. over there. Right. I had Elf movie going through us walking by. <laughs> it. How do you not? Yeah. Um, all right. So. A lot of good things. You're doing some uh, book appearances. You've won the James Beard Award. You stopped by the James Beard Award. So a lot of fun stuff. All right. So a lot of people do know you from your restaurant and events like this and even the books. But there are a lot of people that don't. So get me up to speed. Give me a little background on your journey in life and wine that got you to the restaurants and then eventually New York to, you know, talk about your book. How did it all start? It's so fun to be in New York. It's always, um, you know, since the restaurant's been open, it'll be 20 years in February. Congratulations. Thank you. No um, small feet. <laughs> I feel like I still feel when we first open, like I'm trying to still do the same things, work, you know, we're, we're on the floor. We have the best customers. And I realize, wow, we've seen a whole generation grow up here. <laughs> now their it's kids true. come in and I, they, you know, different you know, same with even within our our working team. But we um, I've been working in restaurants for a really long time, like <laughs> over 30 years, like about 35 years, which is, you know, I was young, but um, I'm from a big family. And I grew up in Nor I was born in San Francisco, born, uh, grew up in Northern California. And it wasn't really even known to be first and foremost wine country. Of course, there was beautiful wines and right. incredible families making wine. Um, you know, with great histories. I, I just had a, was talking with Pete Segacio, whose family had, um, you know, moved in to Sonoma in the mid 1800s. And now he's making cured meats in uh, Hillsburg. But it, and he's, you know, excited to see what we're going to talk about later with the different, what's going on with California winemaking. But I started working in um, restaurants. I dishwashed, bust, uh, hosted, Became a server, uh, went away to college in San Luis Obispo for a year, finished up at USF. And I was um, fortunate enough to open uh, the first left bank with Roland Peso, uh, who also had La Folie. And then I moved into the city and I worked for most of the 90s at Fleur de Lis and also with Julian Serrano. So I had really great mentorship and chefs. And most of the fine dining was pre.com. It was French. There was a Alcarello was open at the time, but and I did my externship from cooking school there. So they're like family. Um, you know, it's a so nice community you, in San Francisco. When you said yeah. cooking school at that point, mm -hmm. you were into hospital hospitality and the food side of it. I was in the front of house and front I, of house. I was studying to be a sommelier. Um, and then I actually there was a fire at Fleur de Lis. So there was a wine yeah. thought rolling through your head. But you went to cooking school instead. Yes, I will. I always was loved it to, to compliment cook. it, or you yes. thought you were going to leave wine behind, or you thought you were going to do both. I, you know, my one of my first trips to Italy. I didn't grow up traveling like you know our kids do and things. Me neither. Very <laughs> but, untraveled as a kid. Yeah, I, I mean, so I grew up with like eating lasagna with ricotta. That is not the ricotta <laughs> that we have now, and um, and so when I went to Italy, I really had this light bulb go off. I, I was already just in love with the history of, of Italian wine and grapes. And a lot of them weren't really represented in our markets and they weren't on exams for, you know, like they are today. And the quality wasn't where it is today. And All right, so overall, yeah. Stop there because I that's an area I want to go much deeper in. Okay. I want you to finish your, your chronology. So you yes. had some great, you went to cooking school, you had some good experience with some good people at good restaurants. When and why does Southern Italy. open my, <laughs> you go to Southern Italy, you come yep. back and you say, I, I want to open a place. Yeah. Sort of emulate. My husband already had a, a his first bar. He opened when he was 26. Um, actually, he was 29. It took him a few years, but they were working on it. And um, it's, it was a North Beach Basque family style. It was previously a Basque family style restaurant. And the people from Ernie's used to drink there when Robert and Dobby worked there and the, you know, Gotti brothers and, and the Rujas's who I worked with and things. But um, they, so there is a lot of history of wine education 
in San Francisco. But um, so he had already opened it. And then we were looking for a pizza and a wine bar. And I had never had Neapolitan pizza because it wasn't really a, it's not really a West Coast as much as it is on the East Coast. And, it wasn't even but, huge on the East Coast yeah. until not that long ago. Yeah. It, it existed, but. It's become, I think, with uh, the world being so much smaller in terms of like information. Yes. Like we have like, you know, when I first was going to Southern Italy, there was no iPhone or Google Maps. And I'm talking, iPhones came out, I think, in 2007. So the world's changed so, so much. And it's exciting because now you can find these remote places, stay there, visit, explore. And when I was driving around, um, that's how the A16 got its name. We kept finding ourselves on the main thoroughfare, which is the Autostrada 16 from ah, Napoli to Bari. So there's the name. Yeah. Okay, so that was around mm-hmm. uh, the Naples region. Yeah. All right, so Italy influenced mm-hmm. something that had been burning inside you. You come back. Yes. And you start scouting. For- I didn't understand how just the simplest ingredients together, you don't need much, but when everything's just right and it's so handcrafted and fresh, it's just rich that lifestyle. You tasted and I wanted to recreate, noticed bring and it explored back. there, right? Yeah, yeah. I was like, we should be able to do this, but like, it does easy set, easier said than done. Well, because, they they farm differently there yeah. than than we. Mm-hmm. You know, everything's processed flour. They use, yeah. you know, they get tomatoes from farms. We get processed tomatoes. Yeah, so. tomatoes are religion there. The types, I right? Mean, so when everyone's you came back, you, is the best one. You so. wanted to. <laughs> you know, sort of present that. All right. So what happens? You start scouting for a location. Does that take long? Do you get up and running? You know, when we you found, we were looking at a few locations and then we needed the wood burning ovens for the Neapolitan pizza, which was going to be a, a big part of the, the menu. The ones you see in Italy and now here, the domed ones. We have one of the, we have that in uh Oakland location for the okay. Stefano Ferrara, which is an artisan oven uh, handcrafted ovens with, you know, volcanic floors on the, in there ah. on the pizza to make the pizza and he can custom tile them for you. And, uh, he's amazing, but we would, wood burning oven in general, it's not as easy to come by when you really like something's grandfathered in. It had been a restaurant called Zinzino. A lot of people knew Ken Zenkel had opened a Neapolitan pizza. And before that, it was like a, a dry cleaners for 40 years. So there was all this water fountain features in the Zinzino. Neat. Yeah. So you open in around what, 2004? Yes, Valentine's Day. (laughs) You remember that. (laughs) Did it take a while to find locations or you looked, saw a few and were able to pick one and get it going? Or, Uh, you know, 2004. So, um, you know, when 9 11 happened, a lot of this restaurant had only that we took over had only been there a short time. It was, not the most booming moment to open, but sometimes that's that's right. when you want to find your location. And so um, the restaurant that had just, you know, opened up in a short time hadn't really ever had a chance to take off. And right. um, and so when we got the space in 2003, we had about, by the time you signed the lease and everything, we had like six months or less to open it. So it was very DIY. Right. Yeah. Um you got it open and your vision going in was executed when you, you opened. I mean, you wanted to expose the world to terrific pizzas that you saw in Italy and wines that you knew burrata. people were. A lot of chefs first had their first burrata with us, but now we can get it. Things are fa- coming over faster. It's so so, I, I, so I, perishable. I wanted to ask you, what's different now than then? I guess yeah. availability of agree- mm-hmm. ingredients. Yes, but there's more restaurants that are using these ingredients so, so you, you have to be able to get dunk. it no yeah you have to be sure that you can get them on a daily basis and you know keep it in stock and as fresh as it needs to be because it's kind of it's like fiano and burrata if you're you know someone's going to order a fiano diavolino i have a like select list that i will pour by the glass because i want you to experience right. a really high quality one even if somebody said hey i'm going to give you this to pour i wouldn't and it wasn't from you know, representative of the the way the grape can shine. Right. I won't. I won't do it. It's, it's, uh, re- representative of the way the grape can shine. How about 
giving something to someone that doesn't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, Fiano. Yeah, we think backwards. As <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, God bless you. Yeah. I mean, that's you sort of the foundation of who no you problem. are, you know, by, you know, bringing all that stuff in. So you get the restaurant going. I, I mean, do you get it up and running, you know, yeah. first year or two without, mm-hmm. you know, any We major- had our investors paid back in a year and a half. Which is, you know, was I mean, our who wouldn't goal. die for a yeah. place like that in their yeah. neighborhood? Uh, you know, that type of thing. Thank you. So and fun. We have fun. We re- I have. I'm having more fun now than ever. Actually, I miss twenty work years when I'm not there. Which I keep telling you yeah. is a feat in the restaurant business, yeah. and to not be burnt out, and to do that. Well, I think part of it may be that you have more than one location. So, at what point did you open the second location? You felt comfortable enough, and you wanted yeah. to expose more people. When does that happen? Well, we in two thousand eight. Also, we were going when they had economy kind of went down. Right, another. We had thing. we had um, uh, been going to La Marque. We were, we were going to do a Marquejano restaurant down by Mission Bay, which is now just really starting to boom. But um, we were a little ahead of the time when the you know economy sort of crashed, and we divested. We just get, you know said we were not. We, we pulled out. We said we're not going to open right now. It just seemed like you know, maybe too risky. Yeah, wrong time. And it was a big project. So then we already were going to do that. And then Pascal Rigo, who has, um, he has a company that he had started called Bay Bread and Boulangerie that he had sold to Starbucks later. Um, he had a little restaurant on Fillmore Street that he called me about. Called, and we ended up calling it SPQR. And we opened that instead of the two, the, the small footprint, instead of the Marquejana restaurant. And um, so I owned and operated that for 12 years. And that had, you had Michelin star for I think seven out of the 12 we, had, we were there. And At SPQR. Yeah. But Amazing. I sold my ownership there in 2019. Why? And now, just uh, when you open in restaurants, you never think, where are we going to be in 10 years? You know, what am I? You want to be like busy right away, get everyone paid right. back and thinking. And then not ever. I'm in this for my profession and life. Not everyone involved was. Right. And so it just worked out to be the best. Like they, uh, so we sort of like split ways and, uh, you know, it was, it was the right call. You, you actually got yeah. at it a good time. Yeah. You know, the world changed that. and it would have been who, difficult to manage. Who would have And predicted? then you had to worry about, yeah. you know, your foundation place, you know, A16. Mm-hmm. Um, another curiosity I had is you're in Tokyo. Yes. What the, that's. I know. Tokyo ha- has now become the food destination it's of the incredible. world. And yes. it's being wrecked. You know, they say some of the best pizzas made yep. there. We know Great. about sushi, other stuff. What was the connection to Tokyo? They um, Mitsubishi was opening a new, uh, they, has, they had a new building. It's called Brick Square down in Marinoche. Mitsubishi, Pren- the company? The company. Okay. They own a lot of real estate in Tokyo. And um, they were looking for, you know, here we're Southern Italian. There we're California Italian. So um, there is this actually stunning location in Brick Square. It's on the street level, and there's a courtyard in the middle, so you can sit outside or inside. And um, you know, they just they approached me, and we went over there, and it worked out. And now it's been 14 years. So it was years. kind of a yeah. good and- coming together that. And that's not the Wait, only location, is it? Yokohama as well. That's crazy. And Yokohama was um, got in the 50 top Italy Asia this year too. So that's kind of a new thing with the Neapolitan. Oh, it's actually not only Neapolitan pizza. It's different types of pizza. Right. But, um, you know, Neapolitan is, I think, the because it's an Italian organization. Right. Like pizza means different to, to them than it means to Americans. You know, and where you grew up and what right. you have. So, right. yeah. Um, we talked off air that you really don't get to New York that much. I'm just curious. Do you have to or get to Japan much? Or it's I get there once more a year. More than New York? or Yeah, probably more than New York. Same or more? Right. Uh, more. Well, I... When's the last time I you were in New York? Being besides in both. <laughs> besides yeah. June. Yeah. Yeah. It had been oh, yeah. too many years, right. actually. Right. I was feeling like it had been too long. Um. That's amazing. Yeah, the friends I've I've seen them has been like five years, six years. Yeah, unless they've gone to like Texom, which I do right, every year, things like that that yeah. are you yeah. know around. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask you in a bit, you know, how you got to the book, which kind of ties all, 
you know, this together. But before we get into the book, I have a bunch of questions. Um, do you remember why? Was it by plan or did you stumble on the fact that you got attracted to wines of Southern Italy? Stumbled well, in. You you went on a trip. I was a blank slate completely. You yeah. didn't plan the trip and say this. I'm curious about you got there and then you, your eyes opened I up. I was learning so much about Italian wine in general. And I'm still learning about Italian wine actually. But I would look at wine books that um, has a sommelier and actually not know what the wine was. Like take the Terra Brune wine from Santati. I didn't know what it was. And I asked my friend who's a wine rep and knows a ton about wine. What's this? I don't know. And then, you know, I was looking at books and I had it. Most people were asking for Brunello's, Barolo's, right. Chianti. But the, they had these other wines in the list, but they, nobody really asked about them. And then we were opening. There was so like some of the wines I was getting that were older had some of them had like dust on the bottles or like I was going to say, cases. does that stuff sit there? It, it obviously it was did, right? A ridiculously inexpensive first opening wine list, and um, I look back and I date myself because I'll be like remembering how these inexpensive these wines were and what great producers. And then now there's just. I mean, take Mount Etna, for example. We couldn't, we could get one when we first opened. It was um, Cotonera, Barbas, like the Barbazale. They didn't have their single vineyards then. Um, we, then we got Bonanti, and then we got Paso Picharo. And now we have 100. We can do a month and dig deep. And we're new wines coming up all the time and Contrada systems of 133 that are, they're going to add nine more. And it's just a really like a whole, like a changing world that even the people on Etna are like, what, how so, much are these wines? So go backwards for a second. <laughs> you find yourself wandering around Southern Italy. You're tasting the wines. You already had some wine knowledge. What is it? Was it the quality to value? Was it the acidity? Was it the, uh, you know, what is it that like, Oh my God. Yeah. We, um, the two. So wandering around is, is really accurate actually. Cause I would show up on people's, doorsteps like um, Antonio Caggiano and Clelia <laughs> Romano um, and, you, and, you know, just be like super fans and saying like, like, cause I can, I can get their wine. And there was not a lot of Tarassi out there that you could get at the time or Fiona Davolino. And then same with Bruno Di Concilis. When I found out he had a sparkling wine, I went down after I was just enamored with Pestum and, just the thought of the Greek ruins and the stories and the history. And I just like cold called him and we've been, you know, amazing friends ever since. And he's just thinking, why are they, why is she so interested? You know, cause they very, they sell their wine locally. They have big cities around right. them. So there was a lot of the unknown America's very that you far discovered. Away. Yeah. Did you know more about Barolo and, and yeah. Tuscany than Definitely. that area. So you were awoken to a lot of things here that that really caught your attention. Yeah, so curious. I, and- I had to write this question down because I knew I wouldn't remember it or I wouldn't say it right. But what is it then when you first wandered and stumbled around that still resonates now about these wines? Is it more producers, more accessibility, consistency? I mean, what it hit you then, it's still hitting you now. What is it? I think just like in everything with Italy, they have artisans, they have family traditions, and they have unique cultures from town to town. It could be like if you're talking about a dish, it's basilicatas or a cate with. Yeah, you know, Rape is like has a sinise pepper on top and Puglias doesn't, you know, so, so things like that. So more of that, yeah, you know, that's noticeable to and, somebody like you. And, and grapes and the same way. The and, book is about that too, you know, mm-hmm. so, so we'll get into that. Um, I keep pushing things off, but trust me, we'll get there. <laughs> um, this is sort of a question that I could ask you when we talk about the book, but it, it's, it's a more general question. Um, you obviously have a philosophy and requirements, yours, 
for what makes a good winemaker and good wine. Um, and one of the things that's been buzzing around for a decade is natural wine. Mm -hmm. And natural wine is not something that you tag in the book a lot. The book is only about, you know, wines that are made, you know, very thoughtfully. Um, yeah. So w w what we, are your requirements? We have a lot of them on our list at A16. But, but I'm not even saying, you yeah, know, but, not, but guys that aren't certified that have been practicing, you know, yeah. guys who haven't, who have been certified. What, what are the things that, you know, are important to you? You, you sort of said a few small. Farming. Farming. Farming is, practices. Is, is, is huge. And a lot of the producers that we're, you know, drawn to in the, in the way that they make their wines very thoughtfully and carefully, and they, they care, they want it, they are drinking these wines and they're living usually on the property of the vineyards. And so it's, um, you really tell that story. You really feel connected to them. Like when I was uh, doing the James Beard, uh, eight regions, we did eight regional bites and eight wines we have and we talk about the gross together goes together on the right but people really got to live that you know through the food and wine matching and i you know no one had had batarga and we had like batarga we had um oven uh roasted some cherry tomatoes with batarga some celery. is what fish yes roe it's roe yeah egg. it's like a phoenician egyptian origin that was brought to sardinia and they right press they, it's like pickled eggs and they press the row and it's a popular it's ingredient now, yeah though. and you shave it on it's a luxury yeah. ingredient and you don't need much it goes for it lasts for a long time but it's it's distinctive and aroma and flavor so so when i asked you the question you said three things that i always think about and in the right way comes up these are thoughtful winemakers thoughtful usually means you know, thoughtful farming, proper farming, you know, sustainable. Yes. It doesn't have to be checked in the box of organic or biodynamic because they could be doing that anyway. Artisanal, you know, smaller, family. I mean, that those are really the things that help answer that question. And I'm gathering if I look on your list, which I have, there's just a ton of that stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, can you, when you wandered through southern italy and it resonated with you and you made a life out of it when you came back i'm just curious today is there a region like that anywhere that's yet to be discovered or is totally underappreciated or oh yeah I mean, absolutely throw me one or yeah. two things um Okay, so I would say in the north, probably Val d'Aosta. Okay. And so it's the tiniest region, but it's really like the Italian side of Mont Blanc, Monte Bianco. <laughs> and then you go like one valley, extreme um, viticulture, where you have the, the smallest growing season because the snow comes early, melts late, and those are the grapes that had survival of the fittest right there. And they're amazing, like Pre Blanc. Turret. And tiny, tiny, tiny producers there. Tiny producers produce a certain way, not a ton of stuff on people's wine list, not on the tip of people's tongues, mm -hmm. which is where the wines that you've been, you know, championing were similar. Even uh, Calabria, it's a big region, but it's hard to find the wines. Anything outside yeah. of Italy that comes to oh. mind to you? Oh, um, I am a wine geek in general, so I love things like, the, I'm an island lover, like Canary Islands. Okay, I think That's Canary exciting. is here, though. It's here, yeah. What you, you know? What's the next canary. canary? You know, guys like um, Envinate, they're mm -hmm, you know established. So good. Well, I think Eastern Europe's going to be. I mean, like I'm like, um, Kate did a book called Lavash um, a couple of years ago, so she got to go to Armenia and really see like the, some of the origin of wine making in these caves and was you know since she, we've been writing and traveling through Italy for the last twenty plus years. She, we've been having fun with the book events because we can go back and forth. You want to tell the story? You want to tell the story? And um, it's just so much fun. So um, with Armenia, she was like sending me photos from, you know, really old places where wine is also being rediscovered right now and allowed to be made. So, I think you're right about Armenia. I mean, I'm reading more about it and the varietals and people are 
liking them. Um, and I think it's a good story. I agree with you on Eastern Europe, too. Um, they're sort of having their time now. The Dalmatian coast, Croatia, yeah, all these Turkey, yeah. <laughs> all these great places. Um, I didn't ask you this before when we were talking about the restaurants, but how is San Francisco now? I mean, if you're here, and I know yeah. better than to believe everything. I know. It's Every, the everyone, end of the world. It, like people come to New York and yeah. say, don't get into a taxi. The guy will get, yeah. you know, yeah. don't go to San Francisco. It's <laughs> shut down and home. But, you know, you're an yeah. operator there. Mm -hmm. You know, that vibe can affect your business. Yes. I mean, what? Tell me the state of San Francisco, you know, now and how it sort of affects the business. I think, you know, um, maybe like on the coast, we're exposed to a lot more from um, international travel and people coming in um, for different different reasons. On a city like San Francisco, we're very open, welcoming, and everyone has a lot of... Um, rights you know we want to make sure people are looked after nobody wants to see anybody homeless it's a big problem but um i think it's getting better and i think there's a lot of people focused on what that means and and how to make it better i mean i have a freshman one of my sons is a freshman in high school and last year he learned how to ride the bus because the students you know ride for free and he's all over the city eating everywhere and trying new things in. Yeah. And he, um, he didn't learn that from me. He learned it from his friends and they're just like having, you know, they're having, um, Good for them. it seems like they're having a normal childhood and they, um, are used to seeing homeless, unfortunately, but they're a little tempered by that, Yeah, but they're not coming home screaming. Oh my God. You no, know, the they're, world is they're empathetic and they care, but they also are like, life is, this is like, the reality they're growing up in right. and but and they I, understand it and accept it to some extent yeah they they are um you know be, learning some street smarts but also like i'm really proud of the decisions they're making and that they're um you know doesn't deter them from going to kick the soccer ball at down at the fields and things like that so um, I always yeah. grew up jealous of city kids, even though I lived yeah. very near to New York City, right outside. It wasn't, you know, living in a city. It's a cool thing. It's a more worldly kid. Um, all right, Shelly, we have to take a quick break. We're talking to Shelly Lindgren. Shelly is the proprietor of A16 restaurants in San Francisco, Japan, the San Francisco area. And she just wrote, is it your third book? Two cookbooks and a book about Italian wine, and rightfully so, because she is one of the experts. And it's not just about, you know, the areas that we talked about. It's it's everything. Um, so when we come back, we're going to talk to Shelley Lindgren about her new book, Italian Wine. You're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Cheese lovers, Assemble! From September 29th through October 1st, Wisconsin Cheese is proudly hosting their first ever Art of Cheese Festival this fall in the home of cheese, Madison, Wisconsin. Over the course of the festival, you can learn how to pair cheese like a pro. Art of Cheese is thrilled to offer classes on pairing cheese with wine from industry's leading sommeliers, cocktails from spirits experts, chocolate, and coffee, yes, coffee, from a former cheesemonger. At Art of Cheese, you can level up your artisanal cheese-making knowledge with a curds on, deep dive amongst the cream of the crop, and celebrate all things cheese by dancing the night away as the bell of the Wisconsin Cheese Ball. You won't want to miss out on this pastured paradise. Run, don't walk, to www.artofcheesefestival.com to snag your tickets and cheese the day. All right, we're back. We're back with my guest, Shelly Lindgren. Shelly, let's talk about the book. Um, let me state the whole title. Italian Wine, which is how we're going to refer to it, but the book is called Italian Wine, The History, Regions, and Grapes of an Iconic Wine Country. All right, so I need to get what I call the vitals out of the way, okay? <laughs> um why and when did you decide to write the book? So the first two books were half, they both covered all of Italy to get collectively. But like the A16, we covered um, the islands and like from Abruzzo, 
south. And we included Abruzzo because they mainly use olive oil in their cooking. Right. And that was like our deciding factor and like how we have built these fictitious boundaries on the wine list for different reasons. Um, so that covered that. And then SPQR book covered the other half of Italy and regions and wine. And then 10 Speed um, at first wanted um, us to write a Southern Italian focused wine book. And then it changed quickly to be an all encompassing, just Italian wine book. Without we without the food component, well, although we do have where did change come from? Them, dishes. you just it was a better idea, or it came from actually that came from me because I um, I even though the south of Italy is really as like a, my heart is there, I um, love all of Italy right. and love drinking Italian wines and learning about them, and I um, wanted to do just cover everything and kate and i decided to organize it in the way that we have it in the so two parts. when was this was this, this was, pre-covid oh my gosh this was uh, oh so let me think about this talking five six years no, ago. no no this was 2014 was the first time we talked about it 16 is when we said okay this is when we're gonna do it and when did you technically sit down and start putting it together we right i think by, yeah right about like 16 17 okay um did COVID have an effect on yeah. writing it and releasing it for you? It did. So we um, were, we originally had a two book that we were going to do together. And Kate and I, we started, uh, Italian wine was like the big one. And then we had a little one that was me food and wine pairings. And it was called, um, it's called Wine Style. But during COVID hit and I could not. Put that down? It, that was, it became a, like 100% Kate's book. And it's done really well. Yeah. It, it, it happened. Wine the style. Wine style happened. With Kate. With Kate. When did that it's, uh, uh That came, so she was, uh, that came out, I think, in 2021. Okay. I think. Right, kind yeah. of in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So how long did it take you guys on this book? Yeah, so with me being at the restaurant every day, except for the one week we were shut down, I was there morning to night, early to late, and, um, <laughs> and uh, we didn't do to go before. We, and also uh, the wine we could do, we could sell retail wines. And so we did all kinds of creative ways of selling our products and making it fun for guests. Like we did a bottle on a box at first and you know, a bottle of wine and pizza for $25. Smart. And there was a wine, a wine friend who was like, how can I help the restaurant? And they gave us a really good price on the wine so we could still charge it. But we were really thinking we wanted the guests to have fun. And what can we do? Because it's all new for us. Right. Um, and then um, I started a wine club, which we just stopped because the book came out. So it was supposed to follow the book. So we did each region. And you'll find that if you're if you were a member of the wine club in your reading, you'll be like, I remember this story or something like that. And, um, and so I... Um, so I, I just think that we, it helped me focus on wine through the wine club because right. I had this, I, I, I could write about, those are, those are the regions we focus on in the book to cover, make sure from, we had all the information we wanted. And, and then, um, you know, so it was a lot of back, just emailing back and forth with Kate and I constantly. Now a tough time yeah. to travel and you yeah. had traveled extensively, but did you do any specific travel? Did you have to go back somewhere or did you travel for the book or your yeah. body and knowledge was so oh, there? Yeah, we have, I've been to Italy. I've been to every region many times, some more than others. And, and more usually. More than Kate? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Kate and I have been together um, on the trips many times oh, for over years. And, and they're usually like road trips to corners that we, we laugh about today because it's like, you know, we got off the wrong Island. We're all, we're right. going to Istia. That's what we makes get off at fun. Porchita or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and then we have to figure things out. So, um, my, my last trip there before COVID was 2019. It was about a six week trip and Kate met me for about half of it. And then, we went down and, the, and then she had to get back because she also had other books and things she was writing. And um, so that was the last time before the book came out that I went to. So from then to the book yeah. coming out, you hadn't traveled there? No. Okay. Because we turned the book in 
It was, uh, oh, maybe I did go to, um, I did go to the Veneto to Prosecco Superiore last October. Okay. So. Um, it's a testament to how much travel you did in advance. I mean, one of the reasons you could write the yeah. book is like you said, you've been there so many times. Um, and the, they, the producers also make their way to, um, visit the restaurants and we host dinners and taste wines and we ask them questions. Right. Like you're asking me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Right. That's cool. Um, this is a semi low blow uh, question, sure. but you could certainly handle it, okay. but it's a pitch question. Okay. And you know, I want you to be thoughtful about okay. it. Okay. Um, you and I know a bunch of people recently mm -hmm. have written books about yeah. Italy. Good people. Yeah. The Joes, one's yep. older, one's fairly recent. A lot of people have written books where they extensively include, you know, Italy, whether it's Raj or Aldo Som or any of these other guys. Um, tell me, you obviously, when you sat down to write the book, you wanted to take, why is this book different? How is it yeah. different? You know, what are you trying to do? I think that our approach is um, the book's separated in two parts. So the first part, we're, we're history buffs, not buffs, but we really love history and grapes and Italy. They tell you so much. And then when you take the country like Italy, it's like the most biodiverse country by like long shot. And um, so we, um, Kate and I had discussions and, and the reason why it's organized the way it is, is you can, it can be a reference book. But we cover climate, we cover grapes, we cover history. In the beginning, the first part just goes like an abbreviated overall history of Italy and the history of wine in Italy. And then you go to, uh, that's just understanding Italian wine. And then we go to, we start with Abruzzo and we go all the way to the Veneto. So A to, v, a to B, 20 regions. 20 regions. Side question, because I yes. want you to stay on the main. Is there just 20 regions or you cover 20 regions? There's just 20 regions. It is 20. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah. I knew you would know the real answer. Okay, so history, then regional. But within the regions, you discuss sort of a format, you know, the yeah. same thing in each. Just tell me quickly. We try to give equal opportunity to the different regions. I mean, some are small like Molise, so there's less to discuss because... Not as much happening. Of course. But we didn't like, we didn't want any, re the regions to really overshadow each other, but we also didn't want to, you know, not put in as much information as we can that's relevant. So if you have, um, if you're going to, if you want to know about Calabria, it tells you all about the whole region. But we also put references and indexes in the back that we find really useful for people who want to study all the DOCGs which are right. constantly changing or, you know, go, we have recommended. Tell everyone what a DOCG is. Oh yeah. Okay. That's the, the place DOC, of origin. DOCG. Yeah. It's like DOC, DOCG, but, and, um, and, and it matters. I mean, we're doing a class at A16 in a couple of weeks and I put food and wine recommendations. I'm going to take people through 10 regions. Two of them, they said they were like, they're, they don't have a DOC, so I can't use them. So Italy really pays attention to this, but winemakers can make a choice. But the quality of the to. wines in those areas yeah. that are not part of the organization, there are still thoughtful, artisanal, yes. small guys oh my making. Gosh. You know, the best. so that's, that's there's so a whole good. politics to that oh, yeah, thing, politics. which we're not going to yes. get into in this show because that's a show on its own. Um, <laughs> we're going to jump on everything you just said, but I think you did establish the difference. I think history is important in this book. Um, and there's a bunch of history questions I have. I mean, people think of Italy and they think the history goes back to the Romans and the Greeks, which it does. It does. And, yeah. you know, nobody could look at a map and figure out what country was what and what emperors were ruling. But tell me if I'm wrong. A good starting point is for our intensive purposes, our drinking, owning a restaurant, what excites us, from the 1960s on, things really started Absolutely. ascending. Tell me, yes. you know, why that time and what the ascension yeah. was. Um, well, World World War One and Two were huge um, for Italy. There was a couple things where there was a lot of depopulation and people emigrated to places like America or in South America, especially, um, and you know, both both. Um, and, you know, like we have in San Francisco, it's a lot of um, 
people from Lucca, Genovese, and Calabria, some Sicilian, and that's like mostly here. And then you have New York, you have a lot of the Abruzzo, Napoli, I mean, um, Sicilian, Sic- too. yeah, tons of Sicily, Sicilian, but, um, you know, just, just, uh, with the 1960s, what happened was a lot of people had left all the vineyards and farms and, uh, you know, I mean, there's, it goes back even farther, but they need to go get work in the cities is what happened. So and, the rural yeah. thing collapsed a little. It just, the economy was depressed and, right. And uh, almost like some parts were almost like third world countries in the south of Italy, which one time had this glory days, you know. And um, and so that's about when areas like, let's say, Alta Piemonte and Boca area, people weren't really in the, um, after Industrial Revolution too, people left, you know, making, it was like a big, um, I know they made clothes and garments and they still do have obviously like Italy with, with its uh, clothing. Big fashion yeah, country. Big fashion. Um, the Barolo really built up and that was like 60s, 70s and what we get to see today. And some of those producers go back farther, but in terms of every stone being unturned and the crews and knowing where all the vineyards are, that's modern day wines. Right. And, um, you know, they were tra- in Piedmonte, they were trading, um, you know, trading in French because France is so close that everybody spoke French there. And that was the way of, right, of Northwest. time before. Yeah. So it's uh, the, the history is just incredible because that's where a lot of products came from during like Marco Polo and Venice and the Venetian Empire there right. to, you know, getting ingredients from South Italy. But wine is well, you, you say that wine wine making started in southern italy yeah that's true i mean the mention of alta pamante barolo barbaresco yeah. even tuscany i mean it was kind of happening then i mean the Earl- etruscans were making wine okay they were i mean absolutely but um and so and there was tri- there was tribes of italy that were making wine and there was gr- definitely grapes in italy but when the greek Empire um, came to Calabria and the South of Italy, Basilicata, Sicily, and you know wherever you see like a K, because there's really not a lot of use of K in um, Latin. And so, what is the K? K is Greek. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of okay. K in Greek, and the and when you see like um, you know the old spellings of certain things, you know the Greeks were there. Right, right, right. So, um, but that were that was really where they they came to Calabria and said this is a land of wine. It was like vine poles, is how they in Otria is what they called it, and they thought it was a sign from the gods because they mm. have their god of wines, and, mm. um, and so they brought that back and to Greece and and it was a lot of grapes and um, viticulture were a lot of the the trading of the seas back to Phoenician times, too, and you know that. You could go way, way back, but really in terms of bringing grapes in the grape the viticulture, the Albarello system, then some of the Pasito winemaking and right. things that come from, you know, evolved from, you know, went how the, when you're studying like, you know, Western um, history, it kind of starts in Greece and then, then in the way we learn it here today, right. you know, right. so it's the same for grapes. When you look at the 60s and forward was did people return to rural areas did they get their eyes back on native grapes yeah you know farming not screwing up i mean did all that That's stuff a good question. start i love that question did it all yes. start you know yeah. evolving better than well i always think that i mean in my from where i'm sitting like some of the Poverty in the south of Italy before, um, you know, they really started focusing on on indigenous grapes and realizing, oh, we have our own grapes. Just because the world right now wants Chardonnay, Cabernet, we don't have to plant that when we have our own grapes. But there was a time in the 80s where other, you know, some of the more known regions or places like, you know, for instance, like Sicily, where the grapes can grow in such large quantities, you know, that's like they, a lot of people buy, would buy grapes from Sicily and Puglia. You mean more output into, per hectare yeah. than mo- it just. Oh yeah. Just 
there's just Sicily grapes everywhere. Sicily was known for that? Okay. Oh, yeah. It'd be top. So it's hardy. <laughs> it's, it's hardy. And they just, the wine is grapes. Everyone has gross grapes there. And, um, I mean, now more than ever, too. But, but uh, so a lot of people were purchasing grapes to blend into like northern italian i mean i mean northern european wines from right. france from like every all, Venus, Venus yeah. Fair, yeah so there's a little bit of italian wine and most most wine i'm kidding there's not, <laughs> <Hope> not. <laughs> there could be no i'm just kidding yeah. uh so but i i do think that um some of the less international some of these southern regions had less international grapes just because it was like a it was a monetary thing. Right. And you were forced to figure out what's you just here. Made your own and, wine. Yeah. 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 Um, what, um, that's part of the answer, but Italy, like nowhere else, um, the growth and progress from as far back as we talked to, to the sixties, to the present is so affected by history. I mean, it seems it's more Italy, maybe France has some, but I mean, do you agree that just the wine progress and growth is so history? I agree. Connected? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, Italy's pretty much, it's not, it's a young country, but it's a, has a deep history, like very It's old young history. as it is, yeah. but it, it, a lot Today. of stuff went through. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, finish boundaries your change yeah. and things and grapes, you know, different get Different countries running it. And yes, that. Yeah. exactly. Um, th that's pretty interesting because I guess because of all of that, you know, history. And like you said, I mean, the book starts with a historical background. Um, we talked about the fact that the book covers 20 regions, mm -hmm. which is nice because it's not a book about southern Italy, which maybe one day you'll write about. But you have. But the... It's like you said, Abruzzo to Veneto. Yeah. So it's it's the twenty one. It's comprehensive, regions. definitely. Um, we talked about the format. You know, there's a historical background, and then in each section, because you're such a foodie, at the end of the section, which I love, you recommend producers mm -hmm. in every region, mm -hmm. and you know, spot on in my mind from the little I know. Um, you basically, if you're a wine lover, could look at a book like this and just purchase, throw a dart at any of your recommendations. Oh, people and have been doing that already. Bring home, I'm so you know, great happy. wine. But there's I get also photos of uh, wine labels all the time. Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> and then there's obviously the food aspect. You know, you've written cookbooks. Yeah. You're, you mm -hmm. know, very tuned into food and wine. Um, you talk about food in each region, how yeah. availability or just classics, uh, dishes that you can expect to, to see, or if you want to try to make them at home and you want to get recipes, we don't, we didn't do recipes in this book, but right. we just write down if you're in Rome, let's say if you're in Lazio, what are things that you might find there if you're in Friuli, where what are you going to eat? I was yeah. just in the Alto Adige. Oh, I, amazing! I, I love the region. Didn't know yeah. much about it. Got invited. Did podcasts, and I didn't realize that's like the home of Spec. Yeah, that's and the home Spec of is you know at the back of your thing and all that. So I mean, it's a pretty good travel guide yeah. too. You know, if you're looking to pick wineries to visit or to buy or food, I mean, it's pretty good that way, and it gives you all that orientation. Um, all right, let me ask you a bunch of questions. Because really, the 20 regions, like we said, are Abruzzo to Veneto. Um, they follow a format, and they're very intensive as far as the information. And um, to that point, what's when you look at the 20 regions, what's the region that really has your heart? Which is really, you know, what what's... I'm asking you who your favorite kid is. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, or a few, yeah, you know, you don't yeah. have to, you know. Well, you know, I feel like, um, on the last trip I went, I hadn't really spent time traveling through Bruzzo like I had, and it's so magnificent. And also I'm a huge fan of Matera and Basilicata. And also I would say, um, when you visit, most people visit Rome, but they don't always they don't, go they around. They do the touristy stuff. Yeah, they don't, they don't take wine into yes. consideration. They, they just so don't, what should so, they do? I mean, tell I, me the wines, yeah. the regions, even drop I, a winemaker I'm, name. The, one of the main uh, reds is Cesanese. So we, we have a photo of the book of Damiano Cioli. 
Just a spell f- Chesanese. C C E S A N E S E. Chesanese. Okay. Chesanese. And that's kind of it's a, a Roman. You're gonna when you're around yes, Rome, you'll yeah. see Chesanese. Okay. And you could go visit. It's like 30 minutes southeast of Rome. There's a beautiful um, pre-Greek um, native Italian town called Cori, not far away. Spell. South C-O-R-I. Cori. And there's an incredible producer um, named uh, Carpanetti there. And they C-A-R-P-I-N-T-I, do... C-A-R-P-I-N-T-I. I, yeah. Probably, yeah. And they have local grapes that are like Bellone, B-E-L-L-O-N-E, um, you know, uh, Nero Buono, like, you know, just beautiful grapes that you really don't see that often. But if you tasted it, it would taste familiar. Um, there was some, you know, Frescati had a big, was was really well known for a long time, but then kind of like Verdicchio and Suave, they got a little, um, you know, more, less focus on quality, more on quantity because... Right. It was, uh, you know, they would sell it in a very inexpensive price, but you could still get tons of great value. And those wines go great with food. I'm a huge fan. Well, it's cool because yeah. more people travel to Rome than a lot of the wine regions we talk to. Yeah. And a lot of these people are into wine. So there are great opportunities, you know, to taste wine in and around, you know, Rome that are sort of indigenous oh, to the that gr- area. The list in, in the restaurants, they'll have all these wines. And f- coming from yeah. you, it's a high recommendation. All right. What region, this is like lightning round, what region <laughs> has the most diversity in varietals, climate, mm. soils? You know, one place that kind of runs that whole gamut. I would have to say Campania. Okay, so variations in climate. Mm-hmm. The soils go one place to another. You're talking yeah. different compositions. Yeah, there's volcanoes. And, and grape varietals? Yeah, grape varietals. Too. All right, yeah. so if you're looking for uh, that diversity, Campania. All right, was there a region that for the intensive purposes of writing the book and your knowledge was more difficult to cover or write about? You knew less about it or people weren't as cooperative or, I I mean, do you walk out of here going, whoa? Um, You know what I thought, I thought was going to happen and the opposite sort of happened where I left Tuscany to the end because I was like, I'm just going to let needs this time. I'm just going to let it, you know, there's so much history but then actually it was it was less complicated than I imagined. I had so much fun talking about the feudal systems and all these things. It was, it was magical. So you pushed it aside for those reasons. Yeah, I pushed it aside. And when you got there. I thought it was going to be all... harder and it was easier. Well, again, that's a testament. <laughs> but the opposite happened too. How? So when I got to Friuli, which I've been many times, but to talk about it is like a really the, it's a very strong uh, history and um, it's, you know, you want to do it justice and be, you know, talk about things of like, wow, that was really war torn there. And, you know, the, the cold war, that's like on the other side of that boundary was cold. People don't think about yeah. that stuff. Yeah. The cold. And then the wall came down. It was sex, drugs, rock and roll right there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's a good, good one. Good. Um, all right. Last question on this. And you know, I asked you before, tell me regions that were like Southern Italy when you went there now, but tell me, this is Italy. What region should we be paying attention to now? Which I guess is what's exciting you now, or what's a little different now than maybe years ago and what region, and it may be the same is underappreciated. I would say um, underappreciated. I would say probably Calabria or Molise. And Calabria has so much potential. Is Molise M-O-L-I-S-E? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They have a grape called Tintilia. It's hard for me. I'm looking for it and I can hardly find it. All right. So Calabria, tell me about Calabrian wine. Like tell me about some of the major varietals and even throw me a maker. And I've been saying this for years, but it's going to... It's uh, time's not moving so fast there right now. It's just like, but there is, you know, we recently poured a, an incredible wine from a producer named uh, Giovanni Calabrese 
and that's his name is Calabrese. <laughs> and uh, yeah. he's it's called Polino, and it's a grape called Maliocco Dolce, and it is outrageously delicious. Well, it, red so or good. white? I red. mean, I, there is a Malio Maliocco Maliocco spell. M a g l i o c c o Maglioco. Maglioco. Okay. Maglioco. All right, just yeah, for Maglioco. all the tenter- yeah, and it was we're just blown away by how how beautiful it is from one one of uh, Italy's <clears throat> largest uh, national parks right in there. It's where you get the porcini's, truffles, and I think people think South Italy that it's gonna everything's gonna be very hot and big just because South Italy, but it's a lot of times it's not that at all. Really, and the the Galliopo is a is a great expression of that. It's one of the most aging grapes, and also. Apparent to they found out San Giovese from ah, DNA. So very cool yeah. history and connection. Yeah. That's a good one. That's mm. about a good answer. Okay. As far as substance <laughs> yes. as any. You I know, mean, look for the, really- ch- the Chiro. We, we just special ordered um, one to pour by the glass because um, in the A16 book, I mean, it's like a couple of producers reached out to me over um, back then. It was just like the internet. They're like, who are you? Why are you selling so much of our wine? Right. I mean, we love it. It's yeah. so good. And, well, that's and, what you're all yeah, about. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's mm. the highest compliment, you know, the acknowledgement from the maker, um, which is really nice. Um, one thing that caught my attention is you mentioned in the book that alcohol in Italian wine has increased by 1%. And there's always reasons why the alcohol levels go up and down. But you cite climate change. Climate mm-hmm. change. Yeah. Now, you and I could do a whole show on climate <laughs> change in general, climate yeah. change in Italy. Um, but that's a tangible thing. Yeah. How are the growers adopting to this change? First of all, are they recognizing it and are they starting to adopt? Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's an you know, generalization because there's so many grapes in, in, in Italy right. and the it, climates it always are is, always, but, but, but I mean, I would say take Piedmont and Tuscany, for example, Sangiovese and Naviolo are hardy, but delicate grapes. And so, um, if it, I mean, I could use the California for the same example where the old Cabernets were like 12%, like Bordeaux too, 12%. And now you're seeing, not yeah, fourteen, fifteen percent in there. That's and going backwards a little now, right? But I think that the winemaking quality is so high that they're able to pick earlier. They're able to they're getting they're looking for the grapes. They're not like trying to get that out of the grapes. Right. Like and they were it's like certain trends where, you know, Chardonnay was very big. Right. It wasn't really acid, wasn't really the focus. Har- Harker, yeah. Cabernets, exactly. you know, high alcohol, unctuous. Yeah. So I think that there's a few producers like Sergio Germano from Germano Ettore, who, um, you know, has, has vineyards where his grandmother's family had them and they're incredible, like the Lazarito vineyard or, but he's been planting temp, uh, Tempranillo and oh, wow. I tried it and it, he makes it like a tastes like, like he makes his Barolo. So it has a very much more red fruit. So it's a different grape with the same style. process and yes. style. But he did that thinking about climate change because just forward thinking, like, will I need to adapt that way? So not that everybody's doing this, you know, now, tomorrow, but they're thinking, well, you know, um, they my, it, climate will, it plays, Mother Nature plays such a big part in Sure. In the vineyards. So, um, you know, they may be adapting. And in other places where they didn't get as ripe and ground sasso and abruzzo, they're they're excited. They're getting that ripeness, you know. So it just depends where you're, you're at, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's everyone's going to handle it differently. And like you said, you know, every region. I mean, there's been this new market of sparkling wine in England oh, because, yeah. you, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, they're making I, wine. I just, I'm with you. Really I just good. hope everyone, you know, can figure out to the best of theirs because it ain't going away. No. You know, it's not going to stay or, you know, get cooler. Yeah, record heats every year. It's um, All right, so we're talking to Shelley Lindgren. We've just been talking about her book, Italian Wine, Um, which does a deep dive into the history, which has an important effect on wine in Italy. And she really gets deep into 20 regions. And like I mentioned, it's pretty good travel guide, pretty good reference, you know, not a book you hide away. Um, 
All right, I want to talk to you about a few other things other than the book. In front of us, we have a wine um, that you make at Tansy, mm -hmm. and Tansy is your wine. So tell me, <laughs> you know, what Tansy is. Yeah. In a few minutes, we're going to taste it and evaluate it, but tell okay. me about how Tansy came about. Tansy came about in the pandemic, you know, um, <laughs> as we were all thinking of ways to survive through that time. Um, a friend of mine who is my partner here, Kitty Osaline, um, she was part of a group that was concerned about restaurant tours and are we like, what's going to happen to our industry? Um, we have a great community of people and she was, uh, she was there to help actually. So we had thought of, she was also a sommelier and was coming from the tech side of things. But, um, we started with the thoughts like Prosecco in a can, you know, it was always a wine related because, I all, I, all I talk about is wine, Sam, actually. No, <laughs> Even my, I smell my water. I don't know what we got, but, um, <laughs> but we, um, I. Uh, smell this, your water. Yeah, hey, that's my, Pinot Grigio. Yeah, go there ahead. you go. Um, so uh, we, Kitty and I started talking. We started talking about, actually, canning wine's not as easy as it sounds. and It seemed like that was maybe yeah. the interesting move. And we had talked with someone, a Prosecco producer, and we're talking, talking about all these things we could do. And we said, you know, we live right by wine country. And I have a good friend named Megan Glab who is very passionate about Italian varietals. And we have a love affair with Fiano. We've tasted it over the years. And, and so, but I was really like pretty, um, you know, locked down in the restaurants, make every day. But, um, Kitty met Megan and we, and really like did a lot of the legwork to get us to a point where we could actually bottle wine. And so, uh, we worked with Megan about the Italian grapes. We could source organic single vineyard, the things that are important to us. We're an all female brand that has every part, every part of it is like, um, even our, photographer uh, who've taken the labels. It just so happened that we have a theme behind this woman own uh, brand. And so um, we started with Vermentino from Las Brisas. We had a Fiano from a producer in Russian River that Megan uh, found like, and loves. Yeah. Fiano is a love of yours. Yes. Like how many acres in Northern California. Not many. Or the, I, think I, I mean, are we talking like five. under, I would say under <laughs> 50? How about no, under 10? How about under 10? Oh my yes, God. Not much. And you beat yeah. Dan Petrosky to it or something? <laughs> yeah, I beat Dan to No, Dan Dan gets the Greco and the, uh, he, Iberbola Jala. Right, and right, the, right. Yeah, he has, he, that's his Yeah, thing. he's the best. I love him. And um, no, but we're all like minded and friends for this reason. We're really well, into it. Well, it's a yeah. common passion and love. Yeah. And this is our newest one. We just had our third vintage, actually, which is hard to believe, but still young and just starting to, to um, so, go into markets now. So and, let's not evaluate it now, but okay. this is the Tansy Falangina. Falangina. And in a few minutes, you'll tell me about yeah. the grape and the wine and pairings and all of that. Um, so Tansy is up and running, yep. third vintage, mm -hmm. continued plans of, you know, making these Italian varietals, yep. women-owned business and all mm -hmm. of that. Uh, I'll ask you at the end of the show, but now's a good time. If people want to know more, where do they go? To the website? The website, Tansy Wines. T A N S Y. Yes. Wines. W I N E S. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. Um, and we're going to taste that in a minute. <laughs> All right. We're going to wrap up the interview part, but I want to do the wine list with you and then we're going to taste the wine. Um, I'm curious about you, Shelly, because I know the restaurant business is as crazy as ever. Um, <laughs> As a mom of two boys at a very kind of demanding, important, and interesting age, you know, when they're little babies, you can kick them around. But these, <laughs> like you said, one's started high school and all yep. that. These are men now. Men, you know. know. Um, tell me about your work life balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're very dedicated to the restaurant mm -hmm. and wine, and I know as a mom, but. How does that, what's the real, you know, part of all of that? Is it just Well, they total... work with me. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> they, <laughs> they, they wash uh, dishes. They actually, They're yeah. chained to the yeah. sink. No, they want to, they really have the work ethic and they want to work. They see 
us working really hard, but it also, they've become friends with everyone at the restaurants. They're, um, so they're embedded and engaged very, in that kind yes. of environment and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You must love that. I love it. Yeah. And it's fun to see um, their relationships with other people that they're learning from um, because they, you know, honestly, like they don't want to come to the restaurant and be like, it's, that's my mom. Although like we're close where I'm working, you know, and they're like, they have, you know, they watch soccer, want to watch soccer games with the Italians and they have their own conversation about who loves which team. And he'll come by and show his soccer cleats to, and I, not to me, cool. to the, to Dario, you know, and then, and then, um, the older, my older son, he, um, works and he's a pizzaiolo and he also, he's uh, making pizzas. Making pizzas. Sometimes wow. a hundred at so an a event. lot of your connection yeah. and exposure to them physically mm -hmm. is through the restaurant. Yeah. Do you have time to sit home and have a dinner on the weekends or, you know, everything's so frantic, but you're hanging with them at the restaurant? I mean, I like to bake, so I always have the cookie jar full of cookies, you okay. know, and I got, um, we, we connect, but I think even at this age, I mean, I'm really feel like grateful they're very responsible fun they're good kids. kids they're good kids yeah they have a lot of independence they must be familial if they're gravitating towards the restaurant and hanging with you they want to be yeah. part of that which you must love on the inside yeah though and like they sent me like the like since i've been here they're like oh you're walking into new york with like a picture of christopher walken and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> they're funny i that's was funny. like i love that that's the, that's that our... means <laughs> They're thinking about you and they care Love about it. you yeah. when you're not there. That's great. <laughs> um, all right. Before I subject you to the wine list, I have one last question that I kind of can't let you leave okay. the studio <laughs> with. And the question is wine and pizza pairing. Ooh, yes. And I'm going to simplify this because I know wine pairing, you could have a piece of salmon and say this, but once you put a sauce on it, it changes. So I'm going to stick with two things and you change it. A pizza margarita, yep. which is basically cheese, tomato sauce, the dough mm -hmm. and all that. And I don't know about you, but in New York, whether it's slices or takeout, pepperoni pizza. Okay. Okay. Now there's magnificent other pizzas and we're at Roberta's and we'll probably try some, mm -hmm. but you like the bee sting, which has super sod on it um, with honey. Um, pizza margarita, couple of the best pairings. And this is from Shelly Lindgren, who yeah. makes pizza and knows Italian wine better than anybody. It's I take his pizza pairing so seriously. So I'm like, uh, come on. Best what? question. Margarita. Nero Davila and Nero Margarita. Nero Davila, yeah. N-E-R-O-D apostrophe A-V-O-L-A? Yes. And that's from? Sic Sicily. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. a red full-bodied? It's medium. Medium-bodied. Medium I call Thank it medium-full. Thank you for full. correcting it me. It can be full. It can be. Tell me like, why that works. So, Sicily, in the Nero Davila, you have sun ripening that is uh, gives a little depth of flavor to go with the sweet and tanginess of tomatoes. But you add that mozzarella and you want a little something to go with the fat of the mozzarella, but also has enough acidity to highlight the tomato sauce, which is huge. Right. And Big um, part of a yeah, margarita. so I've actually made uh, friendships with chefs over pairings like that. Because, um, all right, so Nero Davola. All right, now we pull out the pepperoni pizza, which is cheese, tomato sauce, little oily cups of pepperoni. <laughs> what goes with that? I mean, I would go to Galliopo, which we were talking to. Galliopo? Yeah. Nobody ever heard of that. No, Spell I know. it. But it's a G A L G L I O P P O. Gag? Gag. Leo. <laughs> All right. No, like, like Gag. a chiro. Wait, G A G L. G A G L I O P P O. P P O. Gaga. Uh, this is the Ga home of Endua, which I don't always pronounce right, but. Um, Where is it from? Calabria. They Cala like their spice there. You Calabrian know? Galliopo. Yeah. Okay. I mean, these have not been recommended by other people with these <laughs> questions and take these to the bank. No, I eat this. I was like, this is my life. Pizza is so like, definitely. I know my Nero Devol is. Yeah. In at least the big cities we talk to, San Fran, New York, mm -hmm. Chicago, you know, and the list goes down, Nashville, Newark, whatever. Um, are, is Galliopo available? Yeah. And, okay. So you can get, is it a quality to value thing? It's not expensive? 
It's no, it's it, it's like not as expensive. It's you could get different crews and things, but you're still probably, um, you know, it, you're there's a lot of quality out there. When you find it, you'll be you'll okay. be happy with it. Yeah. I'm uh, happy to turn people on to that. All right, Shelly, this is our wine list. Five questions. We've asked the same five questions to everyone who's come across the show almost 300 times. <laughs> uh, be spontaneous. Please do not <laughs> dwell on the answers. We got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. So the first question is, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge? What are you curious about? This is separate. Maybe it could include the restaurant. You're also in New York. Maybe there's things in New York that maybe you don't have access or what are you drinking now? You could say beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a great Timorasso the other night, okay. and that was delicious. And Timorasso is from Tim- where? It's from Piedmont, okay. and they've been planting it a lot more, like right outside the Barolo. Timorasso is the grape. From Piedmont, yeah. Okay. Yep. Everyone thinks of Nebbiolo. And I little... drink a lot of Etna Bianco, too, right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that makes sense. All right. This is the silliest question of the group, but it's probably the most perfect question for you of anybody. Favorite wine and food pairing? Not something you eat every day, every week, every... But what's that ooh-ah? Favorite wine and food pairing. Yours, not what you think is a great... You know, what works for you? You mean if I'm cooking at home or out in a restaurant or just like, doesn't matter. What... I can't believe I have well, to hold your hand on this one. <laughs> no, okay, what if, I, if I was going to do a favorite... and what food okay. is... The ooh-ah pairing okay, for if, you. If I was going to take sea urchin on a pasta. Sea urchin pasta. Sea urchin pasta. And I would take something um, from Marco de Bartoli, like a single vineyard, like Grappoli de Grillo, and put that together. And that's like an ooh-ah for me. Now, sea yeah. urchin pasta is mm-hmm. usually sea urchin, the pasta, and what, a little oil or... It's pretty simple, simple. right? Simple. Yeah. Simple, simple. Okay. So it's yeah. really that salinity of the sea urchin yeah. and that mild. And it kind of emulsifies a little. And the wine a, works a, well. Why? So it's, it's also made by the sea. Okay. Light, so rich, pretty. Not that this is exactly, but what grows together goes together. Yeah. You know, from the sea. Exactly. From the sea, salty. Okay, yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Um, you travel a bit. What's your favorite wine restaurant and our bar anywhere? Let's start with when you have time to get out of San Francisco, where can you go and get a meal with good wine? Or where can you go to get a good glass of wine besides your place? Is there... In, in the California or in... A- anywhere. anywhere. Let's start close to home and then someplace that resonates to you. Okay. Um, I would say... Go to, and I'm going to disclaimer this by saying, this isn't your favorite. It's a recommendation. I don't want you to go home and say I heard that stupid podcast and you left me out. It's not about that. It's just oh. what comes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, screw that. I mean, I like so many places. I think it. I like. Who I re- does it I, well? I recently went to zuni and had champagne and oysters and that okay. to me is can't <laughs> you, really you're not allowed to give that answer okay <laughs> but that's okay it's okay no but it's for like a wine so zuni yeah which is classic yeah to the umph degree having a little champagne and wine there you didn't yeah. even say they're chicken and pinot noir which <laughs> yeah we could have gone i didn't get there yet okay yeah, give me yeah. one other one yeah because i i uh give me another one any oh, place gosh. how about italy in Italy, is there a place in Italy that like you always think about, like the food is great in the wine list, or it's just a great wine bar? I had, I've had so many incredible experiences. Um, I went to a place in Tuscany on the sea called La Panetta. Spell Panetta. L P I N E T A. Panetta. Great. Okay. And that stop yeah. right there. That's the pl- type of place I'm looking for. All right, we're going to move to the fourth question. The fourth question is, what is Shelley's favorite all-time wine? In the old days, you would have been a perfect um, candidate for this because I was looking for, hey, what's the rarest, most expensive wine you ever drank? You're exposed to everything. I don't give a crap about that. Here's what I care about. What's that one wine from beginning till now that had the most impact on you? That was life changing. That was a gateway that opened up your eyes. It doesn't have to be one. It could be a couple. But is there a wine and a time 
that you had that you could still cite now and say, you know, when I had this blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. So, so many. I think when I was, whatever when, pops I, was, into your when mind. I was really young and I first had like an older Bordeaux, like a 59 Latour, um, I was working at Fleur de Lis and I didn't understand that wine could age that long. I really didn't know. And, and now I've been on debates on, you so know, 59 Lafleur. No, wait. Latour. Latour, Latour yeah. at Lafleur. At Fleur, yeah. Fleur. Exactly. At Fleur de Lis. Okay. Yeah. So 59. I, All right. That's, so had you drank a little Bordeaux before that? Yeah, I was selling it. Um, oh, okay. But but I was oh my it was in my mid twenties, and so I was still, you know, I wasn't my what my favorite wine was then, and what it is now is completely different. So is there something now like we talk a lot about Southern Italy and finding mm-hmm. your way there and wandering around and championing yeah. it? Is there a wine? then now where it's like this defines you know what i feel or think is there a wine maker there's so many there's so many right now i think abruzzo is having an incredible moment okay where there was just a couple producers we all knew and loved like valentini nato pepe but then you have people like christiana tiberio doing this uh over 100 year old Trebbiano de Bruzese, that's like absolutely mind blowing so that's yeah. a great answer because in that answer was tiberio Peppy and Valentini. Valentini. Yeah. And not the easiest wines to get anymore, not no. the cheapest, but a great example of any wine and a great example of that region. So those definitely. Um, I may have uh, Chiara from Peppy on. I love her. She was and, just in an A16. I know. Um, I'm ah, excited about yay. that. All right. Fourth question. You just answered. Fifth question. You should be as good as anybody on this question. No pressure, all right? (laughs) I want you to recommend to me the best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks. I want you to recommend a red and a white. It could be category. It could be maker. Like Pascaline and I decided that Muscadet is a great answer for the white because if you go to the right place, it's a good wine. It's not that. So that's a category. Then she'll say like Pepe or what. Give me your recos. My kids are in their late 20s and 30s, a little older than yours. They don't want to bring crappy $14 supermarket wine to a party as a gift, but they're not spending $40, $50 yet. So how do you wow at 2022? White, red. Uh, For white, I would go to Falangina from Campania. Duh. So good. So I mean, okay, I mean, we're gonna go. From, I mean, we'll no, lead no, no. Into I knew the, that. So, but I would go to from Campania because that's the most planted white there, and you, their quality is great. Value and is we're great. talking in New York or San Fran, yeah, finding a Falangina for twenty twenty two bucks. Yeah. Yep, easy. Okay, perfect. Give yeah. me a red. For a red, I would probably say something like a Montepulciano di Bruzzo. Okay. Yeah. And that falls in that price range. Yep. Um. That is a terrific, you know, recommendation. That could be a good gateway wine for, you know, Definitely. a lot of other stuff. All right. I didn't mention this, but I will post Shelly's wine list answers online. We do a special posting. And if you go to our Instagram page, basically for the last three, four years, I have everybody's answers in the tab above. Um, So we'll be doing that. And I will also list what we're going to talk about next, which is Shelly's Tansy wine. So every week, when it makes sense, we taste a different wine on air. Now, when somebody's making a wine, we taste their wine and talk about it. If you're a Psalm, I would say bring a bottle, and you are. Bring a bottle that's representative of your program. You know, and you would have brought a Falangino or Fia. But we're going to taste your wine. So this week we're tasting Shelly's own Tansy wine, which we talked a little about. So tell me a little specifically about this wine. We talked about the winery and Megan and who was it, Kate? Kitty. Kitty. I have Um, Kate and I did the book. Kitty and I did the wine. I know. So we're tasting. Tell me first, give me the specifics. We're tasting the Tansy. This is a Falangina. So Sam Vilbro is managing a new vineyard. And it's a first year for all of us, him included, and Megan. Um, it's called the Rancho Coda Vineyard. It's in Russian River, but it's higher elevation. And it is organic, biodynamic. And wow. we are so excited about this particular vintage and uh, being able to have it. We're just like, it's 
we're, we're over the moon. So about. how much, what is he growing? Like a tiny, I don't tiny know. amount. Well, how did you come across? We him? only have 75 cases of this made. Okay. This one because of Megan and Sam and well, Sam knew about the, uh, our project and our focus on, um, uh, California, I mean, Italian varietals in Northern California and we're, yeah, it came so out great. Tell me we were very, before we, were, like, we get into the wine, wine, just tell people about Falangina, you know, what the characteristics are, you know, what generally yeah. you're going to get out of it. Usually, so it's one of the oldest um, grapes in the Campania region. And it means phalanges, like your fingers, because when the Greeks were um, sort of like colonizing and growing grapes, they found the Falangina grapes that were um, coming, like they were wrapped around stakes from the ground. So they thought they looked like fingers. And so they named it Falangina. And it usually has a characteristic, like a maybe a nectarine quality due to it. But um, this one has a really bright acidity. And they can, well, in Campania. Is it a wine known for its acidity? Like yes. Like decent acidity yes. always, right? It grows, um, it grows sometimes in Campi Filegri, which is on the north side of Naples, where you're looking back at Vesuvius. It's like a crater of uh, Naples. So it's very volcanic and miner uh, loves minerality, but it also grows very well in the Benevento Sanio area of Campania. So it can get a little riper there and have less acidity, but be, doesn't, it doesn't need that. It might, so it might age a little light and be a little lighter from the Campi Filegri, but it's not a heavy, heavy white and it's rarely an oak. And it's one of the ancient grapes of Campania. So, um, He's farming very thoughtfully, organic, mm -hmm. biodynamic, no Amazing. low intervention in the cellar. No. No, you said no wood. No. Nope. So stainless steel tanks mm -hmm. and all that. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's give this a sniff and throw it over the tongue and let's talk about <laughs> it. So first, let's talk about the color. It's got a nice yellow golden. Yeah. Not dark, not light, mm -hmm. but definitely presents a nice color. Um I suck at this. You're the expert. What do you get on the nose? Well, I get. I definitely get that uh, kind of nectarine you quality do get the nectar. too. I do too. And maybe a little bit of lemongrass is because it's acidity, and um, there is a, like a maybe a yellow flower component. The lemongrass is yeah. nice, but yeah. subdued. Yeah. All right. Um, Mouthfeel. Kind of a. It's not light. It's certainly not heavy. It's got a nice medium, medium negative or it whatever. It hits all over your palate. It's just mm. really high in acidity. So you feel that kind of pucker. I'd say it's pucker. a medium. Maybe medium. Yeah. It it fills your mouth. When it's colder, it feels crisper. It's we're having like Yeah, you know, I don't mind it wine. To I, me, it's a better representation. Me too. I, I, like, I, I like this temperature yeah. too. This is actually good. Yeah. It's sad in the glass for we've been talking an hour I mean, and 20 minutes. Right. And, and in a ride from Manhattan. That's right. But it was cold when you <laughs> yeah. got here. Yeah. What do the palate descriptors replicate any of the uh, nose descriptors you gave me? What do you get on the palate? I do. I get that. You get same, that nectarine yeah, too? Yeah, I do. I get it. You get that citrus. Like and, that peach pit. A citrus, definitely like a white grapefruit and mandarin quality to it. So there's acidity to this, but it doesn't jump out of the glass to me. This seems like a medium acidity. Is that accurate? Or is, how do you evaluate this? Yeah, city. I think for Falangina, it tastes very close to how an Italian representation, yeah, it feels delicious. like, it feels like it, it, it should. It's delicious. Thank you. Um, so you're very happy with the way this came yes. out. Yes. Okay. What foods? It was our first one. So we didn't know. Your first Falangina. It was our first Falangina and we didn't know we tasted it and we were like, so excited. Well, you're talking like it's the first time we closed our eyes and took a sip. <laughs> you're not talking about three slouches here. Yeah, but you're it. not talking about three slouches, <laughs> no, Megan Gloud. No, no, I mean, no, no. you know, you're in San yeah. Francisco dicking around. She's there going, I can't <laughs> screw this up, you know? Yeah. So you got the right person and all that. What do we pair with this? Oh, you could do so many things. I would say that this is a great salad or appetizer coarse kind of wine or a seafood dish you could do a it could hold fish up piccata the, if you want um yeah piccata is lemon with capers, capers it'll yeah. hold up to all of that right yeah i'm a big capers fan me too in general yeah i like the big ones yeah they're so good <laughs> um eat them like grapes yeah something salty like that would yeah, be great it's perfect it has the body yeah. to hold up with it yeah. um 
All right. So that give me the year. It's which, 2022. 2022 Tansy Falangina. Yes. Is it available online? Yeah, we just okay. bought. We just it just was bottled last okay. last month. So. Oh, so this is a treat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I caught you early enough where I made <laughs> sure you can get a bottle of this. All right. We have to wrap up, Shelly. Let me do a quick wrap up, and then I want to ask you for some info. If you have a question, suggestion, wine happening, or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at thegrapenation.com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, leave a positive review. We appreciate you for that. Um, Follow us on Instagram at sbenruby. Follow us on X, formerly Twitter, at Ben Ruby. I know those are two different addresses, but they're very close. But you can always find us at the hashtag The Grape Nation. As I mentioned, we'll post Shelly's wine list and weekly wine sip selections on our social media sites. Um, let's talk about the book for a second. If we want to purchase the book, where do we go? I it's in a lot of um, shops around. I, I saw it in most book, support most bookstores. your small yes bookseller. Yes, go exactly. into town and buy the book. There's some great and bookstores here. You're actually here. doing some yeah. appearances at places like that, yeah, right? Exactly. And if you can't, can you get it on Amazon? Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> go to your bookstore first, or go to Amazon. Um, you post on Instagram personally. Where do we find Shelly? at oh, Shelly um, Lingren? Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. And then Tansy is at Tansy Wines with an S dot com. Yes, exactly. So if we enticed you about this Falangina, it's, yeah. you could go online and order it. Yep. You have a mailing list. Yes. You have we have a we have wine club mailing yep, list. All and of that nothing. stuff. Yeah. Um and if we are traveling, oh by the way, on the books, if you look up Shelly Lindgren or go into a bookstore. They'll show you the SPQR and the A16 cookbook plus mm -hmm. the new book, Italian Wines. Um, if we want to find out more about the restaurants, where do we go? Uh, A16pizza.com. Okay. Yeah. And that'll get you everywhere. Like we said, there's multiple locations um, in the Bay Area and in Japan. Um, all right. Did we miss anything on the info part? All right. On a final note. On some of our upcoming shows, we're coming into wine festival season in New York City. Um, we'll be talking to Byron Bates from Wild World. We're going to have Raj Vadi and Daniel Johnson to talk about La Fete du Champagne and La Table. Um, I'll be at Caractere doing interviews. That's where I may be able to talk to Kiara from Pepe. Um, she's in town for that. And I will, as I do every year, chat with Isabel Legeron in advance of the Raw Wine Festival. So those are some of the shows that'll be coming up. Um, you'll see everything on social media. I want to thank our guest, Shelly Lindgren. Shelly, for being so easy on the invitation. I saw the book. I said, I got to have Shelly in here. I tried to talk to her at the Charleston Wine and Food Festival. She got back to me right away. She said, this will be fun. She said, I'll record in the studio. Um, <laughs> I'll be in New York. I got the whole day ahead of me. We could sit there and do whatever you want. So thank yeah. you for that. And thank you for doing the show. As always, thanks to our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.